Good morning, Jake's house. Good morning, online. We're glad you're here this morning. Welcome. You made a good decision this morning. I just want to confirm you are going to be blessed. David said, I was glad when they said, let's go into the house. I want to let you know this morning, the altars are open. There's communion over by the lion. Hallelujah. There are flags. There is freedom because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Uh, Jamal kind of landed on this in um, pre-service prayer. And if you haven't been to pre-service prayer, right, Jacqueline? You should get there. It's at 9 a.m. It's right back there in that, that war room. And whatever you, uh, whatever you can do, you can do 10 minutes. Um, do 10 minutes, but it's amazing. So it says this in Philippians 3. It says, I admit I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. Hallelujah. But I run with passion. Say, I run with passion. I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose. Say, reach the purpose. Okay, you're going to have to do a little better than that, all right? <laughs> For which Christ laid hold of me to make me his own. Say, make me make me. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling force. Okay, are you listening? Hallelujah. And it also says compelling focus. So I'll go ahead and read that right. However, I do have one compelling. Do you know what the word compelling means? It means a pushing. It's a leading. It's a pushing. I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past. Say, forget it. I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. And I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victor's prize through the anointed Jesus. Jamal, why don't you just run up here real quick and say, you can do a, pra a prayer press. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're pressing. We're pressing. Hallelujah, we're pressing. Thank you, Father. We are not those who shrink back, but we are those who press, God. We press with the spirit of adoption, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, knowing, resting, trusting in you, God, not looking to our own strength, our own ability, Lord, but we're looking to you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter, God. We thank you, God. You will perfect that which concerns us, Lord. We love you. We adore you, Lord. We're embracing you, God, in a new way, in a fresh way, God. We're excited to celebrate you. The King of glory is in our midst, Lord. We lift our hands in gratitude, God, knowing, Lord, that you're going to shift and change things, God. You're going to change us first, and then you're going to change things around us, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor. Honor in Jesus' name. Thanks, team. You can go ahead and fill the altars. Come on in. Hallelujah. Come on up. Joy rides with the morning. You are, you are, 
crown you king of glory you are worthy to be our king you have proven to us that you are our king that you are our, our provider that you are our healer that you are our shield you are our you are everything we thank you that you have proven to us and shown to us over and over again that you are a mighty god you are a holy god you are a good god and you have good things good things for us. You've got exciting things for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you like what God is doing in your life, let me tell you that this is just a taste. This is just a little taste of what he's got for you. So get ready. Get ready for more. Get ready for more. Get ready for more than you can ever imagine, than more than you can ever dream. Just get ready for that. Get ready for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 40, and in verse 3, it says, The voice, the voice, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. It's our voice that prepares a way for God. It goes on to say, Make straight in the desert a highway, a highway for our God. Our voice can create a way. It can create a highway for God to do exciting things. And if, if you want to make changes in your life or in your nation or in your family or in your marriage or in your job or in your ministry, if you want to make a change, Use, use the voice. Use the voice because it's the voice that will make a way. It's a voice. The voice of a good confession will make a way. The voice of a prophetic word will make a way. And, and not only do you need to be a voice for the nation and a voice for this region and a voice for this world, you need to be a voice for yourself. You need to speak to yourself. You need to prophesy to yourself. Prophesy good things, powerful things. Prophesy things that are going to make a change. If you do that, it says that every valley will be brought up. Every mountain, every obstacle will be brought low. All the crooked places will be made straight. All the rough places will be made smooth. How many of you... I find you go through rough times, hard times, crooked times. Well, your voice can change that. Your voice can change it. The voice of a good confession, the voice of a prophetic word over yourself and over your circumstances. And it says that the crooked places will be made straight, the rough places will be made smooth. And, and because of that, are you ready? The glory of the Lord will be revealed people will see that when you speak when you declare when you make a good confession when you speak a prophetic word over the situation things will change things will change and people will see the change and it says and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
So he speaks. He speaks over you. He speaks over us. And he says, you are the voice. It's your voice that can make the change. And so, Father, we just pray over this great gathering of people here today, here and online. We just pray that we will get a revelation of how powerful our voice is. That we will get a revelation of the fact that when we speak, when we make a declaration, it will be established. And when we speak a prophetic word, if, it, if it's from you and from your spirit and born of you, it will overcome the world. It will make the crooked places straight, the rough places smooth. The valleys will come up, the mountains will come low, and there'll be a highway, a highway for God to do, for you to do what you want to do through us. And so, Father, we just, we just want to be the voice today. We want to be the voice over this nation. The voice in the wilderness. The voice in the wilderness. Making a way for you. And we thank you that as we do that, people will see that and they will give you the glory. Hallelujah. We thank you for change. We thank you for the voice. We thank you for the power of the word. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so we thank you for that. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Oh, glory to God. Did you know you've got such a powerful voice? You've got a voice. You've got a voice. Hallelujah. Well, we welcome you to Jake's House Church this morning. If you're here in this great auditorium, we welcome you. And if you are watching online, we welcome you as well. And uh, we're going to turn the lights up and we're going to go around and say hi to a few people. And why don't you say, we're the voice. When you greet somebody, say, we're the voice. We're, we are the voice. Hallelujah. You guys could take your seats. We want to give Stephen as much time as possible here this morning. Before we introduce Stephen and bring him up here, we want to take our time of generosity here. There's going to be some different ways to give up on the screen. Um, if you're online, you can give on the website or through the QR code there, um, text to give. We also have envelopes in the seats. Um, last night, Stephen was sharing on prayer, and it really got me thinking about, um, thinking about, he was speaking about his mom praying over him and protecting him by um, a lineage of family members praying. 
and it got me thinking about our giving. And it's one of the things that I've been incredibly blessed by is parents and grandparents that have taught me how to give. But on top of that, my grandparents, they seeded into ministries under all of our grandkids' names. They were intentional about their giving every step of the way. There's churches in Renton that have blocks on the sidewalk with my name on it because of what they did. There are Bibles all around the world but from the Gideons that were donated in my name because of what my other grandparents did. And every one of my cousins, it's in the same thing. They didn't do it just for me, but they were intentional about what they were sowing into the kingdom. It wasn't just giving their tithe on Sunday morning as the buckets went by, which was so, they did that. That was part of their giving, but that was one little aspect of it. Their giving extended that. They were intentional about the generations that were coming behind them, and they set a precedence that I get to walk in the blessing of because of their giving, because of them being intentional about the generations to come. And so many times in the church we think about it when we're praying for our kids, our grandkids. I see the way my mom treats her grandkids. There's very little that they could ask for that she won't give them. It was not that way when I was growing up. And all you grandmas know what I'm talking about. But if we take that beyond just praying for our kids and our grandkids, if we take that into our sacrificial giving, into what we would do for them beyond just buying them a candy bar, but spiritually sowing into the kingdom of God to set a standard for their lives leading forward. And what I get to walk in today because of that, and honestly, I've known glimpses of it, but never put the whole thing together and appreciated it as much as as I, we were th- sitting there last night and Stephen was talking about generations of people sowing into our lives. And I kind of got this new revelation of an intentionality about giving. And when we give, we can be that intentional about every gift we give into the kingdom of God. So as you're giving today, I just want you guys to think of that. Be intentional about what you're giving into. Be intentional about what you're sowing into because so many things in our lives we're willing to give for our family and our kids, but we don't always bring that into our giving and our tithes and our offerings. So as we give today, um, we're going to have the generosity team come forward. They're going to pass the bowls, and I'm just going to pray over this. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the blessing you have poured out on us, Lord. We are able to give because what you gave first, Father God. We give out of what has been blessed unto us, Lord. We are so honored and privileged to be able to receive what you gave to us, Lord. The least we can do is give back, Lord. We pray that you will bless this offering, you will bless this tithe, and that it would be multiplied above and beyond what we could ask or imagine for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and pass those bowls. Thanks, Jeff. That was just epic. That was so good. Wow. Well, well, I just wanted to say before Stephen comes up here, I started reading this book yesterday. I didn't even know what this book was about. And then I was like, oh, it's about one of my assignments. And um, so I got real interested real quick. But it says, are you going in circles financially, working hard, but never seeming to make real progress? Do you feel like your efforts have ever been wasted and your priorities have been off? If so, this book is for you. And I've got a word for you this morning. If so, this book is for you. I think of books like lives, that somebody sows so much time and so much effort, but it's like they put their life, their heart, and their soul into the pages. And I just want to encourage us, as a church, we're moving financially. As the church, as the body of Christ, globally, we're moving financially. And we don't want to stay stuck and stupid when somebody took some time, right, to write down and record wisdom from above that we can apply to change our life. And so I want to encourage you with that. Also, Stephen has such a, a healing and miracle anointing on his life. And guess what? He doesn't just go around ministering it. He actually made it into a school. In this school, there are 10 lessons. He didn't ask me to do this, by the way. I was just so amped up sitting back there last night. I was like, oh, I got to talk about this stuff. Lesson one, healing is in the atonement. Lesson two, sozo. 
full healing for your spirit, soul, and body. Say amen. Lesson three, the double-edged sword of divine healing. Lesson four, healing by faith. Lesson five, healing by anointing. Oh, this is just growing in me. Lesson six, healing the broken heart. Whoa. You know, I've been talking to a lot of the deliverance guys, and they're really going after inner healing because if you get delivered, but you don't get healed, right? So this is a whole school where you can get healed. Hallelujah. And learn. Healing the brokenhearted. Healing miracles, signs and wonders. Part one and two, creative miracles. And the reason healing does and does not happen. It's just epic. Jake's house, can you just stand up with me this morning, and can you welcome Stephen Powell to the platform today? Hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor Charles, why don't you come and pray for this man of God? Or do you want to say something before he prays for you? Uh, no, I'll, I'll receive prayer. <laughs> Go ahead. Hallelujah. Father, we thank hey. you that we have a voice here this morning. We have a, 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 a voice that's going to make a difference, that's going to change lives that is going to install and make deposits that are going to make such a difference. And so, Father, we thank you that, that if, if we are willing, none of us are going to go away the same. And so, Father, use this man, this anointed man of God, to speak your word to us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Charles and Pastor Angela. That was epic. Praise the God. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we, we I was able, only able to bring a few uh, products with me, but they are good products. I got a, a what I call a wisdom book there. The Lord's had me in a season for a few years where he's had me focus on wisdom. He says there's a lot of power and a lot of gifting in the charismatic church, but a lot of foolishness too. And we need the wisdom of God because it ought not be that we see breakthrough and we slay Goliath and we see God do all these things, and because of our foolishness, we end worse than how we began, and we bring more reproach to the name of Jesus than anything else at the end. That ought not be. That ought not be. And if we would just add wisdom to our radical, reckless faith, uh, I believe uh, that, that, that we're going to see great things. So I actually memorized for a season, for actually over a year, a proverb every week. <laughs> And I tell you what, you want to be transformed through the renewing of your mind, do that. <laughs> I had a proverb for everything. I was starting to annoy people. I'm like, I got a proverb for that. I got a proverb for that. They're like, will you shut up? <laughs> it was really good, though. Um, so I wrote that book out of the overflow of that. But uh, I had a, an encounter last year. And in the encounter, uh, the Lord had stripped me of my shirt. And I was in the corner of a gymnasium kneeling down uh, in prayer. And I had a huge... Uh, uh, king cobra draped over my left shoulder that I had slain, that I had killed. And uh, the king cobra is one of the manifestations, one of the representations of Jezebel. It's the most, uh, one of the most poisonous, venomous snakes in the world, and it spits its venom uh, at its victim's eyes, and the eyes are the prophets, right? So Jezebel's a specific principality and power that targets the prophetic, and if you have any kind of a prophetic gifting or anointing, you will have to contend with her, and you will have to overcome her. Wow, so I've literally been wrestling with Jezebel since the womb, I feel like, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but it's all been for a purpose. Um, I've gone through a lot of heck <laughs> uh, wrestling with that spirit, but uh, I've overcome that spirit. Praise God. So uh, the reason why I was shirtless, though, is because the Lord was remantling me uh, in, in, in this season. And I was in the corner of a gymnasium of a school, and it's all represented how the Lord wanted me to start a new school. Amen? So I started a new online school called the Kingdom School of Ministry. You can check it out at the kingdomschoolofministry.net. And I started doing more training and equipping and putting together this curriculum and these courses. So I'm currently doing one on blessing and cursing, and oh man, is it good. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit this morning out of the overflow of that, um, but oh man, is it needed. There's too many people that are bound in the body of Christ. There's too many people that have their fire insurance, they have their ticket to heaven, but they're not really growing in what Jesus died to give them, right? And, and there should be this, this progressive. How many of you guys know the Bible says that we're to work out our salvation daily with fear and trembling? So with pretty much all of the graces of God, there's a receiving, there's a 
legal standing, there's uh, belief in the finished work of the cross, what God's accomplished, and there's always usually a working out with all those graces as well. How many of you guys know we're healed and we're being healed? Yeah. Amen? Amen? I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and I'm getting healthier in Jesus' name in many ways. Hey, some because of the miraculous, some because of wisdom. Praise God. <laughs> um, but even deliverance, I've found the ministry of deliverance um, is usually a process as well. It doesn't always work, you know, just in the name of Jesus, go. It's like Pastor Angela was saying, if you don't address inner healing, then many, many times you're not going to deal with the open doors and the legal rights and the spirits will just come back. And we know from Jesus' own teaching that when you cast a spirit out and it comes back, it's not good. It comes back worse. Okay, so, but I'm in the, the midst of a very in-depth uh, uh, school right now on uh, blessing and cursing, and uh, it's really, really good. Uh, this, this, these are things that I haven't just studied in the Word, but these are things that I've experienced, that I've walked through myself. So I believe there's, there's an extra level of authority whenever you're not just speaking things that you have head knowledge about, but you have real-world uh, experience with. Amen? So, uh, you know, pray about it. Pray about becoming part of my online school. You can purchase uh, the schools and the courses individually, or you can pay a much lower monthly uh, fee to become a full-time student. And also our partners, our partners get access to the teachings as well. If you become a student on KSM, Kingdom School Ministry, or you become a partner with our ministry, um, you get access to my Saturday morning, what I call PMC, Prophetic Mentorship Class. I got a few partners here. Like Wendy's one of my partners. I got one other one over here. Um, hey, there she is. God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, but uh, aren't those Saturday mornings awesome? Yeah, I do about an hour of teaching every Saturday morning on a Zoom. I call it a prophetic mentorship class. The Lord said, don't you dare just teach. You need to make disciples and you need to mentor. Right? So whenever you disciple and whenever you mentor, you actually take time to you know, answer questions, talk things through, uh, pray things through. And I've really enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed the last few years doing less quantity and more quality, amen, with, with less people. And, you know, I, I thank God for all the content that's put out there on YouTube and on Facebook and, and all that stuff, you know, but I've really enjoyed just doing the one-on-one -on -one stuff and the smaller group stuff the last few years because that's what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples, amen? So check that out, and uh, it's 50% off all my bookstore uh, here this morning um, at the book table. So if you want that, you better hurry to the book table afterwards, though, because I'm running to the airport after this. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you got your Bibles, go to 1 Kings 19. We're going to talk about Jezebel this morning. Hallelujah. Ooh. Praise God. That's all right. My cup runneth over. Hallelujah. I can spiritualize everything, and I usually do. Hey. Hey. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to break bread with you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to open up the word of God and be strengthened and be encouraged, Lord, and be spoken to directly from your spirit, Lord, through your holy written word. We approach the word with reverence, Lord, and with seriousness. And we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand what you would say to the church in this hour. Let us not be shaken from the firm foundation of your word, of your truth, Lord. Let us not be moved, Lord, by the opinions of man, by the fear of man. But let us be rooted and grounded, Lord, in the firm truth of your word. Let us be rooted and grounded in the hope that we have in you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. I pray grace to minister effectively the word, and I pray grace for the hearer to receive this morning, and to not only be a hearer, but a doer of thy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I have it on my heart this morning um, to just talk openly with you and candidly with you about some real issues that we have in the church. And I speak a lot into the charismatic church because how many of you guys know there was one nation, Israel, but many tribes, and it's okay to say, hey, that's my tribe, and the charismatic church is my tribe. I love the charismatic Pentecostal church, whatever you want to call it, spirit-filled church. I love our tribe. Amen. How many of you guys love our tribe? Yeah. <laughs> I love it, and we have so many precious gifts and precious 
you know, heritages that have been passed down, and we want to preserve those things, and we want to improve upon those things. We want to see those things grow. Um, but as is the case with every tribe and every family and every stream, there's strengths and there's weaknesses. And it would behoove us to understand what our strengths are, but also to understand what our weaknesses are as well, because I believe that God will hold us accountable for the lives that we've lived. Can I hear an amen? I believe he'll hold us accountable for our behavior in this life, for the lives that we lead, and for the words that we speak. Amen? And I want to be someone that uh, doesn't just focus all, all the time on what I do good, but I want to know, Lord, where do I need to improve? Where do I need to do better? Where am I falling short? Where am I lacking in love? Lord, show me. I love the book of Revelation, the prophetic ministry of Jesus in the book of Revelation, because it's just so... In your face, no pulling punches. This is what I like. This is what I hate, Jesus says. <laughs> he actually uses the word hate yeah. many times. He says, I hate that. <laughs> I call it Jesus' hate speech. <laughs> but very, very refreshing. It's a gift from God whenever he tells us the truth, whenever he tells us what he loves and what he hates. And if we end up uh, loving what God hates, well, there's something wrong with our hearts. Wow. Something, there's something, there's an issue there. If we get triggered whenever the word of truth is being spoken, that, that's an us issue. And we need to look internally and we need to say, Lord, what is it that's within me that's resisting you? That's resisting the truth. The Pharisees were constantly triggered. But it wasn't because Jesus was you know, speaking incorrectly or speaking rudely. It's because he was touching on something that was in them. It was actually satanic and it was actually resisting the truth. It was actually resisting the Lord. Yet they thought they were the most in tune with God. Oh, what a curse it is to think that you're most holy and closest to God, yet at the same time, the reality is you're the furthest away from Him. What a curse. You know how many people live under that curse in the charismatic church? Jesus said it plainly. There's going to be those that have prophesied in my name, even cast out demons. Yet I did not know them. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know you. I, uh, I've ministered with people. I've, I've ran with people in the charismatic church who, I mean, some of the gifting, some of the anointing, some of the miracles, signs, and wonders, I mean, just blow you away. Just absolutely uh, leave, leave you awestruck. But with some of the things that I've learned with some of the ways that they've lived their lives, I can honestly say today, I don't even know if some of them are saved. That's a scary thing. That's a scary thing, saints. And we really need to look at ourselves right now in this hour. And let me just tell you what what I believe is available prophetically. I believe that there is an incredible grace, an incredible window of opportunity right now to be set free from things that even go deep, even generations, three, four, five generations deep. I believe there's an incredible grace right now to deal with bondage that goes back to our childhood even before we were even born. The Lord revealed to me last year that there's this three-stranded cord, demonic cord, that he is offering grace to break right now. It's generational sins, generational curses, and generational spirits. Those three. So the generational sin, they all kind of feed into one another. It turns into a vicious cycle. The sin and the behavior actually strengthens the curse, but the curse actually brings on the behavior as well. And that's what gives the enemy, the spirit's legal rights to come in and wreak havoc in your life. Let me give you just some indications that there could be a curse at work or that there's demonic activity. Whenever you're seeing bizarre, unusual, repetitive, crazy things happen in your life over and over again, whether it be engine trouble, whether it be medical stuff, whether it be chaos in your relationships, in your marriage, when you're seeing bizarre, unusual, repetitive things happen over and over again, it's usually an indication that there's demonic activity. And a lot of times it's an indication that there's a curse, that there's a spirit holding a legal title deed to come and go as he pleases. It ought not be that evil spirits come and go as they please. There should be a hedge of protection round about you. There should be the armor of God. There should be an unbroken line of the blood of Jesus and the angel of the Lord who encamps around, makes an unbroken circle around those that fear the Lord. 
supernatural protection, the peace of God, the love of God, having beautiful relationships, having the blessing of the Lord, that is yours according to the kingdom. Jesus died to give you that. And if you're constantly experiencing chaos, infiltration from the enemy, well, there's a legal right. There's an open door somewhere, and it needs to be closed. And many times, it comes back to the way that we speak and the way that we behave. Did you know there's some people I've seen curses break just by them repenting of their bad behavior? There's people I've met, they don't even understand curses. They didn't go to the 16-point deliverance school. They didn't go to Sister So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so who's super anointed that had to lay hands on them and walk them through a 20-day process. They just repented and the spirits became disarmed. They just repented and the title deed of the curse was pulled. If you read Deuteronomy 28, the Lord starts out, He says, all these blessings, they're not only going to come upon you, they're going to overtake you if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and obey His commands. Many times, if you want to walk in the blessed life, it comes down to very simple stuff. Are you going to listen? Are you going to obey? Are you going to repent when God tells you to repent? Come on, somebody. But the issue is, here's the issue. The issue is, there's certain people that are, that are operating in such a way where they're not even aware of what's keeping the door open. They're not even aware of what's giving the enemy legal rights. I know because I was like this for a number of years. With what the Lord's done in my life over the last five years, when the Lord finally opened up my eyes to some of the things I was doing and some of the ways I was speaking, come on somebody, I was like, Lord... How is it that I was doing those things and I wasn't even aware of it? And the Lord began to give me a revelation about the subconscious mind. In the world, they call it the subconscious mind, but in the the Bible, I believe it's called the spiritual mind. And the Bible says that you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So deep down in the subconscious spiritual mind, that's actually where the strongholds are. And behavioral psychologists tell us today that some some believe that up to 95% of your behavior comes from a subconscious place. So did you know that a huge part of your behavior is on autopilot from what's been programmed into the spirit of your mind, and it's in a subconscious place below the conscious mind? That's why you have to really find people that you trust in your life, that can speak into your life with an outside vantage point, and can say, hey, that ain't right. (laughs) That's why that's really, really important, because sometimes we can't see it ourselves. Sometimes it's just like that scripture in Jeremiah 17 your own heart will deceive you. Your own heart will tell you a version of the story that makes you the hero and makes everyone else the villain and, and just, and just uh, uh, allows you to, to bypass responsibility for your behavior. No, if you keep going from job to job and losing every job that you have and it all just blows up in your face no matter where you go, maybe it's time to start looking in the mirror. Maybe it wasn't just everybody's evil and you're the pure little princess. Maybe it's time to look in the mirror. Maybe it's time to say, Lord, search me. Like David said, search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. See if there's any way in me that offends, Lord. I don't want to be right. I want to get it right. Amen? I want to get it right. I want to get it right. But, you know, there's some things in the charismatic church we just need to get back to the basics. We really just need to get back to the basics. Paul said in, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 11, he said, I fear lest you be deceived and beguiled like Eve was deceived by the serpent in the garden that you might be moved from the simplicity that's in Christ. You know, it really, really is simple. You should love God and you should love people. You should obey the first two commandments, which all the law, say all, all all of the law and the prophets hang on just these two. Love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's some people, they can't love people well because they don't even love themselves. So there's some people in this season, the Lord will come to you and say, you need to start loving yourself better. You need to start taking care of yourself. There's this word going around today. It's called self-care. You heard about it? Or some of you, you need to take better care of yourself. That's right. You need to take better care of yourself. Because 
uh, if, if you don't love yourself, how are you going to begin to love others? I know that can be contrary to, uh, you know, Christian thought a lot of times. Um, but it's right there in the scriptures, right there in the words of Jesus. But, but, you know, it really is simple, saints. There's a simplicity to this. We ought to be people of love. We ought to be people of grace. We ought to be people of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen? And if you come to church and you roll around and you scream in tongues and you prophesy over everything that moves and then you go home and treat your spouse like garbage, the Lord has issues with you, sir. The Lord has issues with you, ma'am. Ah, forgive me as I just put my prophet's hat on. Hey. Hey. Pastor Keith isn't here. No, I'm joking. I can let it loose. Praise God. Love you, Pastor Keith. Hey, invite me back. Hey. <laughs> but uh, I can speak boldly into this because the Lord had issue with me. The Lord had issue with me. There was some things that, you know, I, 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 uh, that were instilled in me that were young. And there were some things that I carried for that, that I had to deal with. And, uh, you know, something about Washington. God's been doing a real work as I've been coming to Washington. <laughs> One of my first invitations to come to Washington was a few years ago. I came in uh, with this Pentecostal church. Uh, I won't say which. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it turned out to be uh, the worst weekend, I think, ever in ministry that I've ever experienced. Not to say that anything to do with Washington, although it may have something, but in, in moving on. But uh, I remember um, from the moment I, I landed and the moment I, I was staying, staying with this pastor and his wife, something was very, very off spiritually. Something was very, very wrong. And because I'm a seer and I'm a discerner, I can discern when spirits are at work. And I discerned a very, very strong spirit of witchcraft at work. And some of the hallmarks of witchcraft is manipulation, control, and confusion. Come on. Whenever you're under a witchcraft, it's like, it's like you're having a hard time hearing what the other person's saying, interpreting what they're saying. They're having a hard time hearing what you're saying. Everything's getting twisted. Everything's getting jumbled up. You're having to ask uh, them to repeat themselves. What did you say? What, 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 what did you say? What was that? That's some of the hallmarks, right? Um, and also manipulation and control. Let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost doesn't need to manipulate people. The Holy Ghost doesn't need to control people. And when you're under the power of the Holy Ghost, He won't be empowering you to do those things. God kind of prefers people to choose of their own accord. <laughs> he kind of prefer, prefers people to choose to follow Him and not be manipulated and controlled into righteousness. Amen? But I remember... Um, that uh, I was staying, and it was actually resting on this, this woman pastor, this, this spirit, very, very strong spirit. But she was treating me so terribly, so horribly. I'd never been, been treated like this, not, not in, in, in many years. I mean, I've been treated bad at times in ministry. I mean, if you've been in ministry, you're going you're to go through stuff, but not like this. This was on another level. And, uh, but it was confusing, though, because she had the worship music on all day, and she was praying in tongues all the time, and she was always listening to, like, a sermon and I was like, Lord, what is going on here? How, how can it be? How can it be that someone seems so connected to God, yet their behavior is so anti-Christ, so demonic? And the Lord spoke to me in that moment. And he says, uh, I'm teaching you about the Jezebel spirit. I sent you to live with Jezebel for a weekend to learn about Jezebel. So I learned the hard way. Anybody else? I learned the hard way. And man, do you learn about the Jezebel spirit when God allows you to be abused by her for a weekend? Praise God. But this is what the Lord told me. The Lord told me Jezebel spirit always links up with a religious spirit. And the religious spirit justifies bad behavior because of religious reasons. So the religious spirit says, I'm more spiritual than you. I pray more than you. I know my Bible more than you. Therefore, I can treat you like garbage and I'm always right and you're always wrong. But the religious spirit will justify a person's bad behavior for religious reasons. Yeah. So um, it'll use the justification. For instance, if you have a spouse, okay, and, and you're under the spirit, you'll say things like, well, my spouse isn't living the way they're supposed to be living, and they're not doing their responsibility as a, you know, as a man or a woman of God, and they're not taking care of my needs like they should. And it uses that as justification then to treat them like garbage. 
And that, how, but how many of you guys know the kingdom's like this? As you sow, you also reap. If you sow love, if you sow encouragement, you're going to reap in that. Amen. Another thing the Jezebel spirit does is it uses the victim card to manipulate. It uses the victim card. So this victimhood culture that's arisen in America, it's not coincidence. It's coincided with the rise of Jezebel. And I can remember trying to have a conversation with this lady. It was like the most tormenting thing you could ever imagine. She would go on and on and on on like these 30-minute long monologues, and I could not say a word. I could not interject. We weren't having a conversation. I was just being subjected to these torturous monologues, right? And then if I would try to interject, like, like you know, just to have a little exchange or whatever, she would be like, quit interrupting me. Just like that. <laughs> quit interrupting me. And this was her justification. She said, I was in a car accident years ago, and I had a brain injury, and, and unless I'm allowed to just talk and talk and talk, I'm going to lose my train of thought. So the Lord said, there it is right there. She's using the victim card to manipulate and control. You see, that was, it was all about control. It had nothing to do with compassion. had nothing to do with her being heard. She used that to control the conversation, to control. She set the rules, okay? So when you're dealing with an evil spirit, when you're dealing with the Jezebel spirit, she'll set up rules, okay, for the relationship that you're doomed to fail in. And when you fail, because it's like abuse, then she'll blame it all on you. Are you hearing me this morning? She'll blame it all on you. So there's basic just rules. There's basic laws for human interaction, right? Let me give you one of the most important ones. You can't have a relationship without respect. Okay? There is no love without respect. Okay? So if you're in a relationship with someone and there's a lack of respect, I want to suggest that, that you would have a boundary and you would require respect. Okay? Say boundary. I've learned over the years that's one of the only ways that you can deal with someone who's under a spirit is to have boundaries. A spirit, okay, will operate at times, you know, will just be airborne and operate in the airwaves and whatnot. But these spirits, a lot of times, they prefer to use vessels to operate through. Right? And if there's a vessel, if there's someone in your life that you're connected to relationally, uh, that a spirit is operating through it, you have to have strong boundaries with that person. Okay? Strong boundaries. And we see some of these principles here in 1 Kings 19. Okay? Um, the Bible talks about how Elijah had this incredible breakthrough with the Lord. And, you know, he slew the false prophets and saw fire fall from heaven. And he confronted effectively, uh, you know, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Ashtaroth, more than 850 of them. Uh, In the previous verses, he saw a breakthrough uh, in the rains coming, the drought breaking. I mean, this was a massive breakthrough. How many guys would agree? This was a massive breakthrough, right? But because he treaded on uh, Jezebel's territory whenever he did it, he received a massive backlash. He received a massive retaliatory strike. So just know, if you're dealing with the Jezebel spirit, there will be retaliation if you confront her. There will be retaliation if if you stand up to her right but i want to suggest to you this morning you have to stand up to her okay you have to stand up to her because it's your job to guard the freedom that jesus died to give you and if you don't guard it uh other people won't you have to guard that freedom amen you have to take a stand uh, for that. But the Bible says in verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So Ahab just went to her and was just spilling the beans. And he's really giving her a report. So we all know in this messed up, demonic, toxic relationship between Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel was wearing the pants. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I could hear a pin drop. <laughs> Jezebel was in charge, and Ahab went and reported to Jezebel, not the other way around. And how many of you guys know that's out of order? Jezebel always try to mess with God's divine order. I'm not going to get into this this morning, but the Bible's very clear about what the divine order is in the home. The Bible's very clear about what divine order is in the church. The Bible's very clear what divine order was. In this case, Ahab was anointed king, not Jezebel. 
Yet because he did not stand up and because he did not obey the Lord, okay, and the commands that were given in Scripture, he gave access to the Spirit. And the Spirit didn't just take over his household. The Spirit took over the whole nation. Right? So we have a responsibility as the church, as men and women of God, to uphold godly order and godly protocol. Can I hear an amen? It really is a big deal. When we don't uphold godly order and godly kingdom protocol, we're letting spirits in many times. And spirits want to usurp the things, right? In the, in the, in the Bible, in the garden, God made Adam the leader. But when it came down to mankind falling, the Bible says that Eve began to lead Adam. Eve said, come and eat this. Eve said, come and do this, right? That was backwards. And Satan went to Eve on purpose because he not only wanted to deceive her and deceive Adam, he wanted to disrupt God's divine order. But the Bible says that uh, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me now, when she says the word God, so let the gods do to me, she's being serious. She's not using metaphorical, you know, ancient, you know, just uh, fantasy language here. No, she's in contact with the gods, which are evil spirits. She's in contact with these principalities that are empowering her. All right, so she says, so let the gods do to me more also. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel will deal in threats, and she'll deal in ultimatums. Wow. If anybody has to manipulate you through using constant threats and ultimatums, let it be a sign you're dealing with something that's usually supernatural. Yeah, come on. Right? In healthy relationship, we shouldn't have to threaten one another Amen. into doing what's right. Amen. We shouldn't have to constantly threaten one another and use manipulation tactics to do what we think they ought to do. Come on. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yeah. God, I just want to tell you this morning, God has such a beautiful purpose for you, for your family, for your marriage, for the church. But we've got to clean up some of these things in the church. We've got to clean up some of these things in the charismatic church because I believe the move of God that he's about to pour out right now, I believe he doesn't want it to be a move in which it's, twisted and it's defiled and it's mixed up with all these other spirits i believe he wants it to be a pure move i believe he wants pure vessels that can move purely from the heart of god and not be influenced by these these outside influences amen, amen. the bible says in verse three when he saw that he arose and ran for his life so when you're dealing with a jezebel spirit there won't just be you know fear but there'll be supernatural fear there'll be supernaturally uh, supernatural terror so you'll find yourself under a spirit of fear and, and, and having all these unreasonable, illogical fears, all these illogical thoughts. You'll find yourself stepping on eggshells uh, everywhere you go, right? And that's not the Lord. Let, let me just say, in your home, in your marriage, there ought to be safety. Amen. There ought to be not just physical safety, there ought to be emotional safety. There ought to be a place that we can come together and we can share our hearts and we can share what we're feeling and we can share what we're going through and not have to worry about you retaliating. Not have to worry about you making me pay for trying to have an exchange with you relationally. And I had to repent of that myself. My wife uh, began to retreat into herself emotionally in my marriage. My wife began to get quieter and she began to be uh, more avoidant and she began to shut down. And I, I was having a hard time wondering, like, why doesn't she want to share? I ask her all the time. And it was because the Lord showed me it was because in our younger years, because of my own insecurities, she would try to open up and tell me something and it would trigger something in me and I would react. And I created an environment where she no longer felt safe sharing what she felt. She no longer felt safe sharing her heart with me. And I had to make that right. Amen? I had to be the one that took responsibility and quit pointing the finger. Oh, you're not, you're, not, you're not opening up to me. You're not talking to me. You know, communication. We need communication. No, I created an environment where it wasn't safe for her to communicate. And I had to repent. I had to change. You know, I come uh, from a deep, 
uh, Pentecostal holiness heritage. Man, do we have wonderful gifts. I think you can tell this morning I'm a holiness Pentecostal preacher. Amen? Yes, amen. Unashamed. But also the religious spirit, legalism, and Jezebel run deep in the Pentecostal church. And we end up abusing people and spiritualizing it. We treat some of our own spouses and our own family members like trash in ways that we would never treat a stranger. And we spiritualize it. And let me tell you something. It's sin. It's sin. And we need to repent. We need to quit making excuses for it. I don't care how anybody else behaves. I don't care how anyone else acts. You're responsible for your behavior. You're responsible for your behavior. You have no right to point the finger and say, they made me do it. They made me do it. I mean, what are we, five here? They made me do it. No, no one made you do anything. You have power over your own soul. You have power over your own behavior. Amen. And if you are in an environment where it's crazy and chaos and you can't keep it together, well, maybe you need to withdraw a little bit. Maybe you need to put up some boundaries. Come on, somebody. I learned this in ministry. You know, I had some people in my inner circle of ministry that were quite frankly, under these spirits all the time, and they're always bringing drama, and they're always sucking me into things that weren't my battles to fight, and and it was just a mess, and it was chaos all the time, and I had to make a decision. If I'm going to be free, if I'm going to walk in freedom, if I'm going to walk in peace, there's certain people that can't be in my inner circle unless they have a certain level of maturity, unless they have a certain level of freedom themselves. How about this? Unless they have a certain level of healthiness. I'm big on healthiness. I don't want to be some super gifted, some super anointed prophet and and unhealthy and toxic in my home and in my marriage. Amen? Amen. I, you know, I got a little more weight to lose, praise God, but I have lost over 100 pounds over the last few years. I've gone down like three pant sizes and had to get a whole new wardrobe and You know, I shaved the beard. Some people would say I lost the anointing, but I don't think so. You know, I shaved the beard, though. I needed a new look. But, you know, all of this has come. You know, it's come as the Lord has said, Stephen, you know, it's not my will that, you know, my church just be anointed and powerful and moving miracles. I want them to be healthy. I want them to be happy. Oh, man, what a notion that we would be happy. (laughs) Some charismatics are miserable. And they even spiritualize their miserableness. They say it's all for the cause of Christ. I'm taking up my cross. I'm just being persecuted because I'm the most righteous and everybody else is evil. Yeah. And that can be the case, but be careful that your own heart doesn't deceive you. Amen. Be careful your own heart doesn't spiritualize you reaping of the bad seeds that you've sown. Yes. Wow. There's so many people, they spiritualize it, and God doesn't want you to spiritualize it. God wants you to Receive clearly the truth so you can really deal with the issues. Amen? Amen. It really is simple, saints. We should be kind. You know, I just couldn't believe this woman that I stayed with, you know, at this house. I couldn't believe how mean she was. I couldn't believe how unkind she was. Now, I was a visiting minister. A lot of times people keep their demons at bay when there's a, a, a visiting minister in the house, right? When someone has demons, you know, and they have pet demons that they've become comfortable sleeping with and living with for many years, they can keep them on the leash, you know, whenever strangers are around. But this woman was so bound, so, so out of her mind in a Jezebel spirit that she could not keep them at bay if the president was sitting in front of her. She could not keep them at bay no matter who was sitting in front of her. She was going to lash out. And because I'm a prophet, I think I just drew it out all the more, right? I think I honestly provoked it in her, right? (laughs) Whoa, this is some heavy stuff. What am I I doing, Angela? What am I doing? Is this Sunday morning material? Is that all right? I see the clock ticking down. All right, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. But the Bible says in verse, uh, it says he ran for his life. Okay. So now, now the interesting thing here is there's some times where we don't need to run, but there's other times where we do need to run. <laughs> there's some situations that people are in. I would recommend you get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying to do anything that God doesn't lead you to do. <laughs> 
or anything that's against the Bible. But let me tell you something that, that happened with me. Remember I told you I've like wrestled with the Jezebel spirit like since the womb? <laughs> so Jezebel's come in many times and tried to take me out. I mentioned one story last night happened in my high school years, you know, where the devil, you know, the Jezebel spirit tried to take me out. Well, after that story, the Jezebel tried to take me out again. Um, uh, whenever uh, my youth group melted down in Alaska as a teenager, and I had just one friend uh, that remained my friend, it was this girl that actually happened to be obsessed with me for years. I remember the first time I went over to her house, she had an entire wall dedicated to pictures of me that she had cut out, and it was like a shrine, and that should have been a warning. (laughs) That should have been a red flag, but when you're under a spirit, you can't think clearly like that, right? Right? why you you need other people to say, Stephen, stalker alert, (laughs) right? This ain't normal. But here's how Jezebel really, really latched on to me with this relationship. It wasn't just Jezebel, but it was Jezebel and Athaliah in this uh, situation. So a mother and daughter teamed up on me. (laughs) And this mother uh, was a leader in our church, and I really looked up to her because she actually introduced me to the healing ministry, (laughs) Before, I, you know, you see how strong of a healer I am now, and I've been a strong healer now for years. This woman introduced me to the healing ministry. I had no idea that healing was still happening. And when she introduced me to the healing ministry through some books that she gave me and through like some videotapes that she gave me of some healers, I really bore witness with that. And I knew that I was called to move in the healing anointing. I knew I was called to have a healing ministry. So, you know, I really looked up to her as like a mentor, but then she began manipulating me under the spirit, and she convinced me that I was supposed to marry her daughter. So once again, Revelations 2.20, Jezebel calls herself a prophetess, and she seduces the servants of God. So Jezebel will use prophecy and prophetic language to seduce with. So she began to tell me these dreams that she was having. I had another dream last night that you're supposed to marry my daughter. And I said... I don't feel that, you know? And she's like, well, you know, you just need to submit, you know? You just need to obey the Lord. And it's not about what you want. It's about what God wants. <laughs> In this case, it was about what Jezebel wanted. But I actually, I was so confused and I was so messed up at that time. I was like, you know, maybe God will have me marry someone that I have no attraction to and that I don't love and feel nothing for, you know, just to humble me. <laughs> you know, maybe God will teach me a life lesson out of it. I mean, bondage. Let me just give you a little key here. You know, you, you should be attracted to the one that God, you know, calls you to spend life with. Hey, I think that might be included in the blessing of the Lord. But let me give you a little key here, okay? Just little keys. These are just nuggets, and I don't know what this is. Just all kinds of stuff. But the Bible says that Elijah put physical distance between him and Jezebel, and uh, the mountains exploding, and there's fire, and there's wind, and there's an earthquake, and the Bible says God's not in any of it. So fire just fell from heaven in the previous chapter, yet fire fell on this mountain. And God says, I'm not in that fire, even though I was just in the same manifestation. So be careful with supernatural manifestations. Jezebel can work up those lion signs and wonders, you know, that look just like the real thing, right? Pharaoh's magicians produced the same supernatural manifestation that Moses did, right? So be careful with that. But Elijah got physical distance between him and Jezebel. And we know he was under a curse because he said, I want to die. The Bible says in one translation, he collapsed under the broom tree and passed out. So if you're dealing with a Jezebel spirit, you'll experience supernatural fatigue. You'll feel exhausted all the time, contending with her. Even just having one conversation, it feels like your emotional battery is just gone and you got to go sleep for 16 hours, right? That's an indication that you're dealing with something supernatural. You're dealing with a spirit. But there's also, there's a specific curse that's cited in Deuteronomy 28 in which it says when you come under this curse, you'll lose the will to live. So Elijah is actually under a curse, okay? He came under a curse because he tussled with a principality. Now, this was a woman that whose name was Jezebel, who was the main sort of figurehead, but this is actually a principality, and all those supernatural manifestations that were blowing up the mountain, I believe those were manifestations of a principality. It speaks of the chaos and just the whirlwind that you'll find yourself in when you contend with these spirits. Now, you have to be careful when contending with certain spirits because sometimes we'll tread illegally on ground and we'll get involved in something that God didn't tell us to and we can get into serious trouble that way. But sometimes the righteous contend with curses and spirits 
doing actually what God told them to do. The Bible says Jesus became a curse, Galatians 3.13, and it wasn't because he did anything bad or anything illegal. It was because of what he did right. Amen? Job came under a curse, not because of anything he did wrong or bad. It was because of him being a righteous man. Right? So sometimes you'll just have to contend with stuff because you're doing things right, not necessarily wrong. But let me tell you, the Bible says he put physical distance between him and Jezebel. He wrapped his head in his mantle, and then he was able to hear clearly. So let me just give you a little key. If you feel that there's someone that a spirit's operating through, sometimes you just got to get out of there and you got to put physical distance between you and them. So in my story, the Lord separated me from this woman and her mother before we set the date. (laughs) I graduated high school and I went to a neighboring town about an hour away and I built a house. And I remember just being away for three months, I started thinking differently things started to clear. I started hearing the voice of God again. And the Lord told me while I was away for three months that when I came back, I was not supposed to reconnect with this girl and her mother right away, but I was to fast and I was to pray. I was to put time aside to fast and pray. Check this out. Three weeks into my fast, I got 57 seconds. Hallelujah, I can do it. (laughs) Three weeks into my fast, Jesus appears to me. Face to face. So I'm in a real breakthrough now, amen? He tells me many things. I don't have time to get into all the story, right? I think I've told a little bit of the story before. But here's one of the things he said before he left. He said, you know that woman and her, you know that girl and her mother that you've been hanging out with? I said, yeah. He says, don't you ever talk to them again. Don't you ever talk to them again. Don't send apologies. Don't send an explanation. Don't try to talk it out. Do not say another word to them again. No contact. And that may seem brutal, but when you're dealing with a spirit and when you're dealing with abuse, you've got to get drastic sometimes. How free do you want to be? There's a rule called no contact. Sometimes you need no contact, and that's not because of what you've done. That's because of their choices. That's because of what they've allowed to flow through them. Are you hearing me? But uh, I remember now, I believe in counsel from pastors, okay? I believe in getting godly counsel. Um, from youth pastors and from pastors and from leaders. So understand my heart when I say this. I'm about protocol, amen. But I remember I went and shared that with my youth pastor, and he pointed his finger at me and said, that's not God. You haven't heard the Lord. And let me tell you something. Uh, Your youth pastor one day isn't going to stand before God for you. You're going to stand before God one day for your decisions, so you need to make them. And any time a pastor or a leader oversteps their bounds and tries to make their decisions for you, that's out of order. That's out of order. Nobody has the right to make your decisions for you because they're not going to pay the price for them. You are. So you make your own decisions. So me, as a young 19-year-old boy that's just been through so much abuse in my high school years, can't even talk about it. I had to have the boldness and the courage to say, I respect you, sir, but I'm going to go my own way on this. And then within three months, the Lord gave me my beautiful wife that I'm married to still to this day that I have four beautiful children with. Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout. But sometimes you have to put physical distance between. You have to create separation. It's called boundaries. Boundaries is a really big deal. I had someone the other day say, oh, boundaries, that teaching's demonic. Okay, well, it just sounds like something a demon would tell you. <laughs> Demons don't like boundaries because they like just treading on your territory, and they like violating clear boundaries that God's put in place. Boundaries is a God idea. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, by wisdom, God set boundaries. He said the ocean and the sea will go to this point and not any further. The Bible says that God set clear boundaries with Israel, and when they broke or violated those boundaries, he followed through with a consequence. Amen? Amen. So you will, you, will, you will train people how to treat you by what you allow Amen. and by what you tolerate. Okay? And I want to suggest that you love others as Christ loves the church, but love yourself as well. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And get in a healthy place and, and, and decide that you're going to walk in freedom, that you're going to walk in peace. Amen? Yeah. If you've got a, a group of friends, a circle of friends, you should have people in that close circle of friends that are mature, that are uplifting, that don't drag a bunch of unnecessary drama into your life. I don't have time for any of that. 
I've got a mission. I've got a call. I've got specific things I've got to do. I don't have time to get involved in these skirmishes that are really just demonic distractions at the end of the day. Amen. Amen. Is this helping anybody this morning? I know I'm being a little, I don't know, a little prophetic here. Hey, <laughs> But I just feel the heart of God. I feel that God wants his people to be free. And I know in my own life, God set me free from so many things that has ran deep in my generations. And it stops with me. It stops with my children. I'm going to hand down to my children nothing but perpetual generational blessing. They're going to get all the good and they're not going to get my generational sins. Because by the grace of God, I have recognized my sins and I have repented and I have turned from those sins and I have yanked the title deed known as the generational curse from the demons and the demons no longer have rights. They no longer have the open door in my life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Is this helping anybody this morning? So if I... uh, If I touched the nerve, if I triggered something this morning, just take some time to pray about it. Pray through it, okay? And uh, ask the Lord what what you need to do. Ask the Lord if there's any adjustments you need to make. When we implement godly boundaries, it's for the sake of love. It's not to hinder love. It's actually to preserve love and to enhance love. Amen? And God wants you to experience the fullness of what he died to give you in every area of your life. Amen? But let's quit spiritualizing our bad behavior. Let's quit spiritualizing our mouths that we keep sinning with. And let's use our mouths to bless, to encourage, to to uplift. Amen? Jesus. So let me just pray for you. Father, I thank you for these precious people here this morning. I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus for the remission of sin. And I thank you that it is for freedom that you've set us free. And I pray that your people, God, would experience the fullness of the freedom, God, that you died to give them. In Jesus' name. And Lord, if there's some hard conversations that need to take place, I pray give grace to do that, God. Give grace to that. If there's safety that needs to be restored, let that be restored, Lord. If there's respect that needs to come back into the relationship, honor Lord, let it return speedily, I pray. And Lord, forgive us where we pointed the finger and haven't taken responsibility. Forgive us, Lord, where we've allowed our own hearts to deceive us. Forgive us, Lord. I pray, open our eyes. Let us not be that Laodicean church who thinks they're rich and increased in goods and well off, yet the reality was they were poor, naked, wretched, and miserable. Give us that eye salve for our eyes. Open our eyes, God, to the reality of what's happening, God. Open our eyes, Lord, and I pray that we would be renewed, not just in our conscious mind, but in the spirit of our minds. That every stronghold would be broken, would be torn down by the power of God, and that truth would reign from within. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Wow. That was so good. That was just superior. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up this morning. So I need you to come up this morning. I'd love to interview Stephen for about two hours right now, but maybe next time. Hallelujah. Um, I do want to encourage us. You know, sometimes we go around throwing labels around people and, um, and um, that wasn't the purpose of today's message. The purpose of today's message is so that we can respond to the ability of the Holy Spirit within us to be able to defeat those things. Because if that spirit has um, power or an opportunity to do certain things in our lives, I mean, I have had to deal with that spirit uh, multiple times in my life. And I'm just going to let you know, probably through me and also to me, um, but mostly to me. And um, But 
I have to take responsibility. Where is it getting access? What wound? Where generationally? Because we are changing. So we want to separate personality from principality and realize I can change the person a thousand times, but it's going to show up in another form unless I get that King Cobra. And that's what I'm after right now. I need that King Cobra. Hallelujah. You know that vision that he had when it was like he had actually killed it and he was wearing that victory on him hallelujah and so there are people up here to agree with us in prayer hallelujah we are not victims we are victors and from victory so thank you so much Stephen. remember there's product out there and we are an overcoming church we are going to be those who are skillful in teaching people how to live in the freedom that Christ gave us. So uh, Stephen will be out at the table for a little while. There's prayer partners up here. Marissa, have you got something that you can flow into? Hallelujah. Well, we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
lifting up our soul. We build a throne for you. The fragrance of our worship, sweeter than perfume. Lifting up our soul. We build a throne for you. The fragrance of our Join with all of heaven. We bow down. Holy is the Lord. Worthy is the King of heaven. Seated on our praise, we cry out. Join with all of Join with us.